This presentation will be recorded in two to three parts, Star Systems and Management. Objectives for this presentation, relate HIS strategy and strategic planning processes to organizational strategy and strategic planning processes, align HIS strategy with the mission, vision, values, and strategic plan of any type of healthcare organization, Identify the multiple key components to HIS strategic planning, including software, internal and external networks, data, interoperability, and technology such as hardware, operating systems, and devices. Understand how the software development lifecycle is used to, the, to develop HIS applications. Determine the relationship between HIS programming languages applications and databases. Identify the benefit of application integration over application interfaces. Describe the inpatient and outpatient clinical administrative HIS applications in use today. Explain how computer networks work, their importance in supporting HIS applications, and the different network architectures in use today. Understanding how emerging technologies such as voice over internet protocol, unified communications, and video web conferencing are affecting HIS initiatives. Identify why data center infrastructure, cloud computing, backups, and disaster recovery are critical to properly maintain HIS applications. Define the essential components of modern server computing, including unified computing systems, server virtualization, and single sign-on. Describe the key benefits of client, device, and mobile computing that are being used specifically to enhance HIS deployment. Understand the importance of technologies that deliver privacy and security benefits to HIS applications. Communicate the importance of technology readiness and gap analysis initiatives. Define process improvement in the context of HIS. Develop an IT governance framework using one of three commonly used methodologies. Describe IT service support and IT service delivery using the IT infrastructure library framework. Understand the financial management issues affecting HIS. Manage relationships with vendors. Understand benefits and principles of contract management. Describe HIS project management methodology and knowledge areas. Define roles and responsibilities for IT related functions. Facilitate steering committee meetings and our topics. Describe the planning steps leading to and included in the implementation of new HIS and technology. Explain the key steps in HIS and technology implementation planning and explore the reasons for their importance to the implementation process. Define the main steps of system selection and, and the attuned to success factors and potential pitfalls. Discuss reasons for documenting and streamlining workflow and redesigning processes as part of HIS implementation. Identify key differences between integrated versus interface systems and explain how these differences play out in HIS and technology implementations. Discuss change management. Explain key steps in selecting a new HIS. Describe leadership characteristics and roles associated with adoption of HIS and technology. So HIS strategy. HIS strategy directly ties back into the organization's overall strategies and goals. The first step 
in understanding where an organization needs to put their efforts and resources and what types of efforts or strategies those might be is for the organization to define its mission, vision, and values. These are going to be the beacons that are going to guide their organization through as many decisions and challenges. So your mission, vision, and values are essentially a compass that sets the direction of the organization, sets the tone for the organization. The next step is for the organization to determine how they should go about doing what they're trying to do and which activities is going to get them moving in the, the correct direction. So determine that course for that organization and the criteria for decisions about where they want to invest their resources involves them framing a vision. They need to draw a migration path between their current state and the desire of future state for their organization, which is technically what we're calling that, which is really their vision. Then they're going to have to come up with major directional strategies or enterprise-wide actions that is going to help them to go or move them or propel them in the right direction. The initiatives and projects that they decide on can be described in multi-year goals for their organization. And so in order to make sure that these goals are, uh, these multi-year goals are accomplished, they're going to build them into their budget, whether it be their capital budget, their annual operating budget, um, and specific assignable, actionable annual objectives. So they're going to give themselves measurable steps and tasks so that they can pursue and accomplish whatever they, they figure that their organization and the direction that they should be going, and they can help hold someone accountable for doing that. This is very important to the HIS strategy because the HIS strategy should build be the be to build that information technology capabilities and systems. They're going to want to bring together IT capabilities and systems uh, that is going to enable them to satisfy their organizational strategy and support their business and clinical goals and objectives. So whatever they decide on is their mission, vision, and values, the IT capabilities and systems should be supporting those. Thus, the organization's strategic plan is going to serve as a roadmap for the HIS strategic plan. Your HIS strategic plan should directly reflect the strategies of the organization, and it should be helping or assisting and supporting them in moving in that desired direction. It should support the accomplishments of those organizational strategies and initiatives and essentially be a mirror image of the organizational strategy. So if an organization is trying to come up with an HIS strategy and they don't have a strategic plan, then they need to develop one before they can really be successful and effective with an HIS plan. A strategic organizational plan must come first before an HIS plan can be developed. Your HIS strategy is a bottom line to be a reflection of the organization's future or where they're trying to go. There are four essential themes um, that feed into that understanding of an HIS strategy. One is the organizational strategy that's going to serve as the foundation for your HIS planning. Two, the HIS planning framework. Three, your HIS decision-making processes. And four, the context of the changing national HIS strategy, consumer expectations, and your realities of the HIS marketplace for your products and services.
So our HIS um, and technology plan needs to support and enable your organizational plan from a business and a clinical perspective. And while in, in considering your internal and your external drivers in your organization. So your strategic plan must be based on your organizational plan. Sir, the HIS plan serves its purpose when it supports and enables their organization to achieve their strategies according to their missions, visions, and values. It, it, the planning process is going to consist of a systematic examination of where that organization currently is, uh, as well as anything uh, internally, externally that uh, proves dynamic and changing the different conditions. Uh, it, the planning process is going to define a five to ten year desired future state. So when we're talking about future state, we're looking five to ten years out um, based on that organization's mission, vision, and values. There's going to be strategies identified that's going to help them move to in that desired direction through setting goals uh, and breaking those goals down into smaller measurable objectives so that we can uh, measure those and see where we are and we can have budget uh, put together based on those goals and objectives. The HI strategy using that organization strategic plan as a roadmap, it is logically devised as projects that are going to establish information technologies and computerization that's going to be aligned with the strategic direction of the overall organization. It's going to, uh, that automation is going to help propel that organization forward. It's important that they determine how the implementation of a vendor software product, so say they're interested in this vendor software product to help them move forward in the organization's goals. So it's not the primary focus shouldn't just be on selecting that software um, vendors and help provide them to whatever solution they need, they need in that organization. But that's going to be much less important than them to determining how the implementation of that software is going to address the right types of IT capabilities that they need for that organization at that present time as well as in the future. The vendor needs to be able to work collaboratively with the people in the organization so that they can design and build specific workflows that are going to meet the organization's needs. They need to be able to support effective and efficient business and clinical processes. Because it does not matter how impressive a software uh, system is, if there is no collaboration or it doesn't really um, move that organization forward in their desired direction. So you can have lots of bells and whistles, but if it's not doing what it needs to do to move that organization in the correct direction, if it's pushing against the organization's grain, it's a misapplication of resources. And then there will be low value results that um, come from that, no matter how fancy uh, a um, system it is. Your HIS, plan, your HIS planning should be synchronized with your strategic business planning. Using that organization's business plan as a guide, the HIS plan then documents that current state of the computer systems and IT infrastructure. It contemplates that five to ten year desired future state we talked about, which is like their uh, architecture, and it lays out a path of HIS initiatives and projects that will migrate that organization system from where they are now, which is their current state, to where they want to be in five to ten years, their future state. And the HIS initiatives have to be accomplished in the right order for us to re realize those type results. What you also will see in the organization is that typically you will see a demand for new systems from uh, different departments or areas in the organization. And those demands are, and requests are going to exceed the capacity for the change with it, which the organization is able to support at one time. So one of the keys is going to be to get those who are requesting those new systems and technologies 
for the different departments to actually see the larger picture and understand the opportunities to integrate systems for the entire organization. So we're looking for enterprise systems that's going to help that organization move forward because the fact is that silos are those systems that work just in a, work for a specific department only. They don't really work in terms of moving or propelling that organization forward as it needs to be. So all this lies uh, in thoughtful HIS planning, working collaboratively uh, in multidisciplinary groups according to a discipline methodology, and documenting and prioritizing the organization needs in terms of IT and technology. So this work is going to be done according to a HIS architectural framework. It'll be a combination of top-down and bottom-up perspectives that make this uh, to be a realistic and comprehensive HIS plan. So we take into consideration those on top as well as those on the bottom who, who are doing the actual work. So the plan HIS has to support all business and clinical strategies as well as enable some business and clinical strategies that wouldn't have been feasible using paper-based processes. Right? An example of that would be like your wireless technologies and social media platforms. These allow uh, opportunities that did not exist with just paper-based processes. A good HIS plan is going to advance that organization's performance. It has to be designed using a systematic approach to planning a balanced HIS architecture. Right? It advances that organization's performance through a balanced HIS architecture. And these principles can be applied no matter the healthcare setting or, 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 or what type of organization healthcare organization we're looking at. This is going to be a, a generic HIS conceptual planning framework, HIS planning framework. And so it can be adapted to any type of healthcare organization. It's a non-technical method for thinking about how your HIS is on layout, on the types and categories of software systems that will be needed. And they use a a uh, two by two four quadrant grid, as you can see here um, on the slide. In your diagram's left hand column, that represents your um, transactions or your day to day activities, repeatable tasks that is necessary for uh, the organization to conduct uh, their clinical and business work. Um, these are like real time transactions based. Uh, real-time transaction-based production work that the organization does. In your right-hand column, it represents the information based on post-production or retro retrospective reporting and analytics necessary for them to uh, manage the clinical and business aspects of the organization. Then the top row of the framework refers to the clinical or healthcare service aspects of the organization. Whereas the bottom row um, looks at the elements of the organization having to do with your business or institutional administration. So you have you see there in um, quadrants, All right? So then you got quadrant one, which so your top is your your clinical, your bottom is your administrative. In your quadrant one, which is in your clinical role, that's your transactional activities for um, transaction uh, clinical transaction systems for um, on, on, in a clinical aspect. Um, in your quadrant two, you drop down to your administration role. That's your day-to-day -day transactions on the administration level for uh, institutional processes, business activities. Your quadrant three, which is on the top. On a clinical role is your uh, reporting and analytical 
capabilities for your clinical activities, your clinical management, clinical intelligence system. And then your quadrant four, uh, again, we're back down on your administrative level. Um, that's your management reporting uh, capabilities for your business and administrative aspects of your organization. So you might ask, you know, what does these quadrants and categories have to do with your HIS uh, planning? And basically what this is doing is connecting the types of, fun types of functions and processes that can be supported with autom automation with the types of computer systems and software that's going to provide that functionality. So you've got certain types of computer systems, software applications that are built to support certain functions in an organization. And so we have broke them out into quadrants based on whether it's clinical, administrative, and the types of functionalities and transactions that they support. And once we do that, we can actually connect those to that computer system and IT and software that we need to do those exact functions. All right? All right, so here um, in this one, we, we have um, a similar uh, situation. And I think what I've done is sort of, let's see, did I mix them up? Oh, I see, I got a double. So excuse that. So here's where we need to be. All right, so this is the same um, quadrant for a quadrant kind of table. But we actually placed um, some different things in those quadrants. It's still in the quadrants one, two, three, and four. But here now, what we're doing is uh, it's connecting uh, those functions and process in each quadrant with the type of computer system. But here is just outlining for us the type of uh, processes here. So in quadrant one, uh, in the in the the, quadrant, the um, framework we were looking at previously is that clinical transaction system. And so right there, your clinical transaction system support patient, provider, clinical care activities. All right, so those are the functions. All right, so we had clinical transaction systems in quadrant one. Now we it support patient, provider, clinical care activities. And then in quadrant Two, which is at the bottom, though we have administrative transaction system, and we're supporting institutional business activity. Top right hand was the quadrant three, and we had clinical management, clinical intelligence system. They support clinical reporting, data analytics, outcomes analysis, and then finally in quadrant four. We have administrative management business intelligence system in our previous quadrant. It, it supports business reporting, data analytics, key performance indicators, analysis. All right. So those are indeed um, the functions. And as we said, certain types of computers and, and, and software applications are built to support certain functional areas, departments, and types of transactions. So we remove those types of systems and replace it with those uh, functions in the quadrant. So we can trace our way from the functions or processes of an organization that reside in each quadrant to the types of computer systems and software applications need to automate those processes and functions. We're looking to automate those processes and functions. Um, this planning framework kind of helps us to see the balance needed in the architecture of an entire portfolio of HIS used by the organization when they're trying to support these functions and processes and the information needs of that organization. All right. So what types of clinical and business related computer systems and software packages are we going to, and applications are we going to need to support this organization? Well, we can take this same HIS planning framework and, and fill these quadrants with examples of the types of applications that will fit into those four quadrants. And that is, is what you will see here on the next slide. Software applications that we can use in each of those quadrants. So these are all uh, tied and um, connected. 
And what we will see that's relevant about categorizing in this uh, manner is not just giving us a list of computer systems and software applications, but groupings and relationships between these software um, systems and applications. Because most of um, your quadrant software systems in each of these areas, um, there is an interrelationship. All right? Many of them tend to use the same data element um, to run that system. So you see here in quadrant one, when we're looking at patient provider clinical care activities, you see you got your uh, EMR, your EHR, your PHR, your personal health record, your electronic medical record, your electronic health record, your medical internet, your radiology system, transcription, home health, surgery, ICU system, monitors and devices, all of those support those uh, patient um, and clinical care functions. I mean, quadrant two, you have general financial, patient accounting, contract management, looking at software applications, a, um, human resources payroll, credentialing, all those support those uh, institutional administrative business activities. Um, in quadrant three, um, this was on your clinical management side, case mix analysis, you got decision support systems, um, clinical intelligence, data warehousing, external reporting for like joint commission um, type situations, and then quadrant four was your administrative um, management uh, system, financial supply chain, HR management reporting, cost accounting, financial decision support, budgeting, forecasting, uh, software applications. So most of these quadrant software systems are related due to they use some of the same data. There's, there's a high degree of overlap um, in these quadrants. And when data elements are shared by more than one application using data stored in the same database, then what we have is um, that they are integrated. All right? So when they share um, data from the same database are integrated, but when they share data from separate databases, we say that they're interfaced. All right? And the, the thing now they push for um, more to the interface is integration. All right? Integration is more highly preferable than an interface uh, system. So when we're looking at um, integrating systems, you have to have uh, a plan in place. Uh, it maximizes um, opportunities for integration when your applications uh, can share large amounts of data. So therefore, when you're planning, you have to sort of plan those things together in order to realize that opportunity. Uh, decision processes for system selection need to prioritize the integration between like applications so that they can realize that value. Um, and, and it really increases value when you look at data integrity and the quality of the information produced in that system because they're all based on the same information. And with your HIS planning framework, that gave us a non technical way to sort of visualize. Um, and document that software, how the software applications uh, need to be in an organization and what type of work they need to do. And it helps us to create that balanced architecture and it'll support evenly all the functions that uh, need to be supported in that organization. So as I was saying, integrated systems within a quadrant are highly preferable to interface systems. Um, that planning framework is going to help us categorize those systems according to the functions and applications that it relate to one another and who will possibly share that data uh, with some type of frequency. And, and, and they need to be planned together to maximize the value. 
and sometimes your HIS will operate in a support or process improvement mode, and other times the HIS is an enabler. Um, so basically, uh, with the HIS uh, system, in terms of its function, uh, when it's supporting, uh, it can support that uh, processes. And other times, when it's an enabler, it's making something uh, possible that was not possible before. That's when it's an enabling versus that it's with a process that already exists, it supports that process. So um, those are two different um, ways that a HIS can operate in an organization. But all the way through, the, the, the common thread and the main thread is that that strategic plan, the HIS plan needs to be Align uh, in order to realize uh, these values and, and these strategies, and they also can propel new ideas that weren't there before. All right, so why does HIS strategy uh, matters. Basically, there has been a lot of change or evolution in our world today. Our, our economy is more of a knowledge-based economy, um, and healthcare is expected to follow suit. We have a lot of industries. Um, that have already jumped on the band, bandwagon. So um, HIS health well, health information is fully, or healthcare is fully expected to do uh, do the same thing. So we, we we actually think about everything in a whole different way than we used to. All right, um, we don't think as much visible as we do intangible resources. It, it used to be everything was a, a hands on asset. Now we look at intangible things like um, knowledge. Knowledge resources. Um, organizations are valuing and managing and nurturing the knowledge and human assets of their organization and resources. Intellectual capital is something that you may have um, heard before, which is gaining a, a lot of importance. Um, attain talent, uh, those types of things. Allow knowledge workers to help create and be, be very creative in the organization. They, they are supporting and, and bolstering that type of situation. So it's a different mindset um, than the way we have, the world has traditionally done things where we set to no methods, rules, and benchmarks. Now we want creativity. Alright? HIS and technology uh, is, plays a central role in the emergence of a knowledge based economy and especially uh, when it comes to healthcare. Additionally, HIS and technology has changed the format of information itself, uh, a term used dematerializing information, which basically means elimination of paper. And now that we have we have the paper stored out in a cloud somewhere, we, we've taken geography essentially out of the equation. So geography is not a parameter uh, about sharing this information. Is no information is no longer isolated to a physical location, but we can share information at the speed of light. So we can have information anywhere we want to with the help of computerization. We want to share and collaborate um, across all geographies, whether building, a country, a nation, what have you. All right. So all of these things are, are made for revolutionary changes. Um, it also, when an organization um, responds or reacts to these to this environment, um, the organization has to make changes as well in, in terms of their structure and, and all those things. And in this type of environment, in order for an organization um, to survive. They have to become a lot more fluid, uh, adaptable, right? They can't be so stuck and staunch into one specific thing. 
Now, how, or, how, when we look at uh, organization in terms of its past, a uh, hi, hierarchical structure was what, what we see, right? And so now we, we've been a little more um, fluid and adaptable, but it does not mean that hierarchy is not important. We still see organization structure in a hi hierarchical, it's hard for me to say that word, structure. However, what we see within that structure, organizations are still allowing that change to occur and be fluid immense and amongst that hierarchical structure. Because that hierarchy still provides uh, some type of uh, roles and responsibilities uh, within their organization. But they still understand that all good ideas don't have to come from the top layer, which is the way it was in the past. We can they, they encourage ideas and ways of new ways of doing things from not only their top level, but those uh, individuals who are at the bottom as well, and that brings empowerment to those individuals. So that's where you get your uh, top level as well as your bottom level getting involved, and this is going to create a successful. Uh, Collaboration, All right? So no more rigidity, um, discipline, restricted restricted access to information. Um, so you have systems and technology boosting positive interaction, um, helping those organizations become more adaptable and responsive, responsive to their changing environment and requirements. All right? But this takes a lot of work. It's not nothing that's magic. Um, so they have to get in there and do uh, thorough planning, careful analysis of workflows. Um, they have to streamline, redesign work processes, build systems and technologies that's going to improve those processes. Um, they need to create new connections, open up their communication and access to information. All these things have to occur, and it's a lot of work, right? And that also kind of changes the way we look at IT. IT used to be sort of like a closed department, but now due to our environment, um, IT has to have close collaboration with other professionals in the organization because um, it's just not a silo for them. So they have knowledge about those systems, but they also have to bring in um, other individuals who are familiar with the um, Current clinical guidelines, and then uh, as well as clinicians, um, in order to help this uh, be a success. When we look at uh, our communities, we realize that hospitals can no longer be the center of the healthcare universe. Because our demographics are changing, the population is aging, chronic illnesses are on the rise, and so now we need to focus more on primary personalized care, right? Because we're looking more at prevention uh, rather than trying to treat illness after it occurs. And we know hospitals, their main focus is attending to acute care needs, which a lot of times is means too late. We want to focus on prevention primary personalized care. And then on the scene comes what we call medical homes and accountable care organizations. And um, some of their focus is on coordinating the needs of patients across a continuum for the person's life. Um, so we're looking at uh, coordinating care ranging from their primary care to their acute uh, care, where the needs of that patient is. That's where those medical homes and accountable care organizations come in. Um, again, we want to take that geography out of the equation. That's where we're going, connecting clinicians across their continuum and based on those patients' needs. Um, that continuum reach from the hospital to the doctor's office, to the patient's home or workplace. Um, because of that desire to do that, that's why these medical homes and your ACO models, your uh, accountable care organization models are even feasible along with the technology, right? Integration of that chronic care into the continuum. Um, we had acute care, uh, as it used to be, 
hospitals being in the center and they're focused on acute care, but with the aging population, chronic care like diabetes and hypertension, it becomes important. And so that acute care model no longer is feasible to take care of all this chronic care that's being flooded with the aging population. So these ACOs and these medical homes, they create that fully coordinated clinical care method. This is going to be more or less what's um, needed. Because of this situation, then you, your um, traditional methods of care and reimbursement have to change as well. They have to create new arrangements between the different types of health care facilities, um, new business relationships, new clinical models. Uh, to share the new objectives that we have here, and then that reimbursement model, just speak, speaking that the uh, reimbursement for providing approved set of services no longer holds. Uh, we have to sort of change the way this payment system occurs, and, and that brings about that pay for performance type situation. Um, because that payer driven healthcare system is not going to address our true determinants in health, right? HIS and technology and using organizing to digital a digital health platform using social media, mobile devices, other means so that we can get a little closer and a little more personal um, with our patients. So we have to change the way we are, are, are thinking about um, this situation. We need to connect, have a connected community. Uh, and it's going to be supported by a combination of different types of systems, uh, smartphones, mobile devices, all these things that help us connect and provide us with ways to have real-time feedback and more personalized um, health care for that patient. All right? So including diverse networks, um, have inter- and inter-organizational settings, suppliers, customers, Relationship, community, everything is included uh, in this process. And that technology is going to help us to do that, right? It's going to empower that personalization that we're looking for to help pay, uh, people manage uh, their behaviors and their chronic illnesses and those types of things. And we, uh, one way to do that is to involve that, that patient or that individual directly in the information feedback loop that's associated with that behavior. This has been um, known to and proven that it does improve patient um, care results. We already know we're moving away from paper to electronic processes. All of this has us in a major influx in um, health in the healthcare arena. And it's sad to say some organizations may not be able to get on on that bandwagon based on several different things. They, they maybe they they just are able to sustain sustain themselves without the electronic uh, processes being implemented. And, and we know, and uh, we well know it's kind of expensive within the beginnings of your implementation, but it does have high uh, results. But some may not be able to do that, so they may go on into their act eventually obsolete or they're bought by a larger organization who um, can bring them to where they need to be. But we uh, this thing this um, wheel is moving forward. Right? We talk about knowledge management being very important part of this evolutionary process. Um, it, it, it just um, it's a big evolution, a big change that you, you have to get on board for. Right. There are also going to be um, things that we have not even contemplated due to the technology and the capabilities that we have at our fingertips. Things that we're doing now um, that may change the way it looks, and then other things, like I say, that we haven't even thought about. A lot of times we hear um, the educators and other people come speak to educators say that we're training students for positions and, and different opportunities that don't even exist yet. And so that, that situation, this technology and all these capabilities are making that uh, possible. 
So same thing with organizations when they're doing these uh, analysis of their uh, current situation, future state, they're they're anticipating things that are uh, possibilities um, associated with their features that don't exist yet. But that HIS and that technology is going to be an integral part of this process, right? Okay. Let's talk about data, the actual uh, data. Data is critical to this process. That's all this information that we're deriving comes from uh, data. So your software, your hardware, all your technology, uh, those are very important, but an essential consideration in HIS and technology planning is the data itself. It is critical to develop a data plan that is an active part, is going to be active part of managing your HIS and your technology. So there needs to be a data plan. Because all of this is going to be for naught if that data that's being created by the system and the technology is inaccurate. The documenting and communicating the data plan to everyone in the organization makes them aware of and part of what we call proper data stewardship. We're taking ownership. Of the, data, of the data. We're responsible for the quality and consistency of the data elements that we are capturing in our HIS and IT systems. Uh, other related terms um, that we have heard of before but are related to uh, our data um, is one is data structures. When we talk about data structures, they are the methods and formats used to organize data in a computer. Uh, we often describe them in terms of records and files, things like that. Um, all your IT professionals, they rely heavily on data structures to do their work. Um, their, their ability to manipulate those data elements from one system or other, combining them, uh, whatever, um, it relies on properly managing and programming the commands to actually take those data structures into account. So your data structures are very important. Data dictionaries um, basically are is a directory or database that contains data about the data elements in the system of an organization. You might hear them called metadata, data about data. So that, if you think about a dictionary, it defines data. That's what your data dictionary does. It's defining that data, data about data. Um, so it, it gives us information on those data elements that we uh, maintain in our databases. Always basically need to know what type of which data elements exist in all their systems, where the data elements are located what the data element structures are, and other key information about the data. Data about data, metadata, right? When we look at the term data model, a data model is a map or, ver or, or visual representation showing the way data are organized according to their relationship to key elements of a process. Um, when you have a data database, in, in, in your database you create different tables and, and, and your data elements are in those tables and you create relationships between those data elements. That data model gives you a visual representation of that. Who is related to who and that type of thing. So that's what a data model is. It's very helpful um, when they, they're doing systems engineering and programming. Um, so and it sort of lays out the data in a tree-like structure, showing how they all are related. So you know how to build your database. 
Okay. Okay. HRS applications. We need to understand how HIS applications are developed to ensure that they are going to produce the desired functionality. All right? Your applications are going to require robust, high performing, and highly available underlying technical infrastructure. So you have to have a a very good infrastructure in place to support your HIS application. All your HIS applications are developed using a programming language which allows them to operate by executing programming code. Okay? You can modify your, your data based on end-user input devices or other software programs. And you have large instances of data where they're normally going to be stored on what we call a database. And we just talked about some other terms in relation to a database. And databases have distinct advantages over other types of uh, file types like Excel spreadsheets and stuff because you, are, you have better manipulation of your data in a database versus like an Excel, Excel spreadsheet. Your um, database also can support large file sizes. Um, it has the ability to, of multiple users being able to edit that data at the same time. Um, all those types of things are advantages. Now, with your applications, organizations are going to do a couple of things. Traditionally, your organization um, will purchase license for vendor applications or, or commercial off-the-shelf products. And so what was created um, here was best-of-breed applications. And when you have a best-of-breed application, uh, basically what you have is you have very um, good benefits or advantages or uh, advanced application functionality for specific departments. But it, it, when you look at the organization as a whole, they're generally not developed to integrate or interoperate, interoperate with other applications that you may have in, a, in like a acute care organization or a hospital. And, and as there is a fact that with hospitals, you have numerous applications um, that are going on at the same time in, in an organization. A lot of them are, are related to a specific department. And so with this best of breeding, when they buy vendor applications off the shelf, this is tends to what, what this is what tends to happen is that there will be advanced application functionality for a specific department over here, but not necessarily for another department, and it causes problems in terms of integration and interoperation uh, with other applications, or application integration. Um, now, then you may have organizations who go in and, 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 and have their own customized application development within their internal organization through their IT department. So they deal customized applications that are specific um, to their organization. But regardless of the programming platform used to develop application programs, one of the standard development frameworks you're going to be see, you see used today is what we call the software development life cycle. 
And they apply this to the development of HIS applications. And when they do that, this ensures that that whatever they come up with is going to meet the requirements for their organization's strategic goals and objectives. Now, we call the software development life cycle SDLC. SDLC methodology includes seven stages. The first stage is your conceptual planning. And this is going to involve uh, Identifying and assessing assessing the system requirements and, and enhance, enhancement, feasibility, cost, and risk. All right. The second step is planning and requirements definition. So they want to identify their functional support and training requirements, um, as well as developing their initial life cycle management plans, your pro the project plans, and other operations requirements in this step. Then in the third step, they're going to design. Um, they're going to develop preliminary and detailed designs uh, and, and how that system is going to meet their functional requirements in step three. In step four, it's going to include their system development. They're going to test and, and validate the activity, making sure that that system is doing what they expect it to do. And as well as that, that um, and as well as that, their requirements are, are satisfied. In the fifth step, this is where they're going to implement this system. It's going to be installed and in, they're going to go to production. They're going to train the users. Um, data conversion and system issues are going to be resolved. And then they, their newly designed system is going to be uh, provided to that customer. In the sixth step, you have your operations and maintenance. Um, in this step, the new and upgraded system is going to be operationalized and they're going to do routine maintenance and upgrade, feature enhancements, fix any bugs, uh, and those types of things in step six. In step seven, this is your disposition. This is the end of that system life cycle um, when they retire or decommission that system. And they're going to do their according to proper procedures. Now, if you notice um, in this figure that it's in a, a cycle-like uh, situation, this lets you know that this um, process goes on and on, over and over and over. Because once you decommission, you, you're going to probably put something else in its place, and you start the cycle over. Now you have most of your early HIS applications, they uh, were specific to a uh, department for which they were developed, and we kind of alluded to that a little earlier. And so what you had due to that was a proliferation of non-integrated systems operating in the same organization. So you just have a bunch of silos, a bunch of um, this, this system works right in this section, and then over here in this department we got another system, they don't communicate and those types of things. And so what they tried to do was to develop application interfaces to bridge those various systems together. Right? Um, but this is very expensive, time consuming, and inefficient. So then due to that uh, situation, your system developers uh, looked at application integration. Right, so they they're bringing these uh, programs together at uh, at the point when those applications themselves are first being developed, so that they can share the common data elements or the elements that in which they overlap and use a common database. Yeah, that's that's going to be much more efficient. So it it kind of um, integration avoids building applications in silos. So, but what um, is preferable is in the um, 
development stages is where they need they need to be planning so that they can use these databases more efficiently efficiently when they know these systems are going to be sharing uh, a lot of data. There's a lot of data overlap. Now, um, there are different types of applications. So we're going to look at clinical, some of the clinical applications. These are very important uh, in a healthcare organization. Um, a clinical application is any system that's going to support your clinical care, your ancillary clinical processes, your clinicians, and your patient flow, like your electronic health record systems, your laboratory systems, registration systems. Scheduling systems, those types of things um, will fall under your clinical applications. They're going to improve your quality of care. An EHR, electronic health record, is an example of a clinical application. Right? Um, and there's lots of um, functions that are supported by EHR. Electronic capture of data, real-time order entry. The administrative process is linked with clinical activities in your electronic health record. Um, another clinical act, uh, application would be your clinical information system. Um, it's going to support them with their diagnoses and their treatment planning and when they are evaluating medical outcomes. It um, organizes and stores and double check patient medical information and keeps health history, prescriptions, doctor notes, all those types of things. Um, you got lab laboratory information systems. Um, they're going to support the lab area, the lab work, like your pathology, your chemistry, your blood bank, um, calibrating, uh, calibrations of your equipment, and all those types of things. Your pharmacy information system uh, may assist with. Uh, Elim uh, decrease and eliminate medication errors because um, you are computerizing the system. They also are uh, working in alignment with your your nursing and your other types of applications and systems, especially with nursing with their medication administration records or MARS. You got your computerized physician order entry that is also a part of like of your a physician information system. All these things ensure patient um, safety. They can order um, your medications and order labs and different things on your CPOE. And, and, and when you type in scripts and stuff like that, that also in, uh, helps improve quality and, and efficiency because it's done. Now people don't have to walk their prescription down, they don't have to take the prescription to the Promises is already taken care of. It's no longer uh, handwritten. So all these things, so you don't make any mistakes in, in legibility. Uh, radiology information systems. These are clinical applications included in those your medical inf imaging systems and your your packs or your picture archive and communication systems. So uh, when they have run tests, it manages those test records requisitions. Um, your schedules for procedures, manages test results, uh, all those types of things. Your uh, PACS applications manage image storage, uh, local and remote retrievals, distribution and presentation of PACS files so they store those images from those um, x-rays and stuff on your PACS. You also got outpatient systems for your ambulatory care. Uh, personal health records. Um, they all they they have those now where where you can create you a personal health record for on different websites, and that means you're in charge. You kind of um, compile all of your medical history together, and, and it, it, for, it first to, to adulthood, any surgeries, any doctors you see, any conditions, you have it all compiled, and you can have, have um, your different positions and stuff to access that information as you wish. You have long-term care system. We've already talked about your CPOE, that's your order entry system. These are all clinical uh, applications. Now you also have uh, 
um, administrative applications. The EHRs can be included in this because so they do have um, administrative um, capabilities. You got um, enterprise resource planning systems, customer resource management systems, and supply chain management systems. Uh, patient accounting is an administrative application. They manage your billing and accounts receivables and for your organization. Um, your ERP systems are bundled applications that manage the healthcare organization's financial and accounting applications like the general ledger, your accounts payable, material management, human resource management, facilities management applications. All right. Supply chain management deals with just what it means, supplies. So you have all these vendors and maybe you, all of your needles, uh, somebody brings that in, um, who brings in your uh, bed, uh, pan, or uh, any types of resources your um, organization or facility needs, you have to manage those, uh, that supply chain. And so that's what your supply chain management system does. Telecommunications and networking. When we talk about telecommunications, um, that we're defining this as the electri electrical transmission of data among systems, whether it be analog, digital, or wireless media. Your data um, communication, your, uh, your data transmission can occur across a lot of different media types. They use copper wire, cable, fiber, airways. Um, your you have your um, network for your data communication, and they come uh, consist of three basic hardware components when we're looking at our data communication network, and that's your um, servers, your your client, and, and circuit. Your server will be like your host computer. It does. It stores all the data uh, and software that your clients access. Then your client uh, is that input-output hardware device that you at the end your users in, um, and your client typically provides the end user with access to your network and server. Then your circuit is that pathway in which those messages between your server and your client is going to uh, travel. So an example um, of this, if you are looking at a your um, laboratory information system, you will have your um, laboratory information system server that has all the data um, on it and all the applications the process that data is all going to be located on that server in that organization's data center. Then you're going to have your doctors and nurses, they'll uh, go to a, a, a personal computer or a mobile device um, to, to um, access that information that's on the server. And they use the wireless or your wired networks along that internet, which would be like the circuit. All right, to, in order for that information to pass between the client and the server. All right, let's talk about um, different types of network. So you commonly have um, four different types of networks. You got your your local area networks or your LAN. You got your backbone network, uh, BN. You have your metropolitan area network, or uh, MAN. And you have wide area network, WAN. Now, with your LANs, your local area network, they are all are, are, uh, groups of devices that are going to be located within, that, uh, within a, uh, the same geographical area, like all on one floor, within a building. Or even multiple buildings if they're in close uh, proximity to one another. Um, 
you land to share information and share resources. That's what your network pretty much do anyway. Um, and they, your lands, they can be set up to operate in a client server or a peer-to-peer -peer configuration. Well, when you have a peer-to-peer -peer network, um, your computers share information and resources equally, and so there's no dedicated network server in place. Versus your client server network, where you have one or more dedicated servers that's going to provide the client computers with your, your network services. So that's the difference between a peer to peer and a client server. When you have a LAN, a, a local area network, you're going to have what we call a network interface card, or NIC, in each of your com, uh, computers. And your, your NIC card enables that computer to physically connect to your network and transfer data over a uh, network table. Your network table connects the NIC to the wall jack, the jack on your wall, or directly to a network switch using a uh, copper or fiber optic cable. The desktop computers are going to connect typically using a copper cable. On your server computers or your other network devices can be connected with either your copper or your fiber optic cables. Um, your copper cables, they are made with either a UTP or STP, universal twisted pair or standard twisted pair copper wire. And they transmit uh, speeds between um, 10 Mbps and 100 Mbps, megabytes per second. Fiber optic cables, they're made of uh, fine layers of glass and they use light um, to transmit data. Um, and they're at 10 gigabytes per second. Are higher, so they go a little faster, right? Your lands have your different lands got have to be interconnected by using hubs or switches, and your lands are going to be your basic building block that is going to interconnect all your desktop servers and other devices on your network. You're also going to want to make sure that your uh, land is. Designed to operate at high speed and that is stable. Um, you want to make sure you're on top of remediating any shortcomings um, in terms of how your LAN is configured. Now, it's also possible to have wireless local area networks, we call it WLAN. Um, and we already know kind of what wireless technology is. Um, these can come into play like in a in a hospital setting when they use mobile workstations on wheels. They call them wows. Um, they push it be on like a little thing that moves around and go to different rooms and they're typing in on it. Um, and the laptop and tablets and, and smartphones, it just kind of provides some greater flexibility when they do their job. And when you're using wireless Technology, what happens is they're tra transmitting data on a, a wireless frequency. They're using what we call a WAP, a wireless access point. Um, you'll see those, uh, people may not pay attention to them when you have wireless capability. They, they're uh, in, inside rooms and hallways in the ceiling. Uh, every so uh, many feet or whatever, and as you go, uh, as you are walking and maybe using this wireless device, that data is being transmitted from your wireless device to that wireless access point through your through the air using radio frequencies. And so as you're moving along, as you pass one way out to another, and then you, you your 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 uh, frequencies is starting to hit onto the next one as you go along, and that gives you that wireless coverage. Uh, other various wireless technologies in use today, the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, IEEE -E -E technologies are being used 
for uh, your, your wireless local area networks, and, and they got um, several here. Your IEEE 802.11a. You may have seen some of these letters and numbers, and now you know what this is about. IEEE 802.11b, IEEE 802.11g, and IEEE 802.11n are the most widely adopted W uh, wireless LAN technologies. They're faster, easier, less costly. You don't have to go through the time consuming and extensive process of, of um, putting tabling down for each computer. Okay. All right. Um, your backbone network, they connect your LAN, WAN, and other backbone network together at high data transfer speeds, and, and they typically Span several miles. Your your man, which is your metropolitan area network, they also connect um, land, your BNs and your WANs, and they're usually located within three to thirty miles of each other, and they're often referred to as uh, as campus networks. Now your uh, your WANs, your wide area network. Uh, connect your BN and your MANs, and they can connect devices that are located around the world. And um, usually, you, your commercial carriers are going to be your primary providers um, of WAN. They, um, Support speed of 10 gigabytes per second. Networks may, um, when, when they're using um, your, your WAN, um, your, health, your healthcare organizations usually are trying to encompass facilities at multiple locations. So they're going to connect the LAN. Uh, they're going to connect all the lands at the different um, locations to each other using a uh, WAN. The largest WAN in existence today it will be your internet. That's nothing but a large wide area network. Um, you you connect your you in, interconnect your uh, your your WAN using high speed fiber optic cable. Like I said, ten gig. Uh, gigabytes per second or higher. They use uh, network devices that we call routers to connect or route their data traffic from one LAN or WAN or to another LAN or WAN. Your routers send information through network devices called gateways. Now, with your wide area network, you uh, also can have a wireless wide uh, area network. They're often referred to as a broadband or cellular network technology. They, so they provide service to a large geographic area. So uh, immediately, you probably should be thinking about cell phones, the smartphones, and your tablets. This is how they are working on a wide, wireless wide area um, network. Um, the three families of wide, wireless wide area network technologies are prevalent today. Um, you have, you see, yeah, I'm on here. Um, your global number, your first one is your global system for mobile communications (GSM) and universal mobile telecommunications systems (UMTS). And you have your cold division multiple access (CDMA1). CDMA 2000 and wideband CDMA. And then third, you have your worldwide interoperability for microwave access, WiMAX, and your long-term evolution, LTE. Now, what will make more sense to you, um, those first two that we talked about, 
which was your GSM, UMTS, and then your CDMA. Um, they are referred to as your second generation and third generation technologies, 2G, 3G. When you're thinking about cell phones, this should start um, at least uh, having some type of reference point. And then the third one um, that we talked about, which was that WiMAX and the LTE, these are your 4G technologies. So this should have the same T-Mobile, AT&T, Sprint, Verizon, and all those uh, cell phone service providers when they say 4G and those types of things. So this is actually what they're talking about. Um, another um, concept, BYOD, bring your own device phenomenon. And basically what this is referring to is um, when end users um, are using their personal devices, like your smartphone and your tablet, for both personal and work use. And some organizations decide that they're going to officially support that. And, um, and then other organizations have some type of policies about BYOD. Um, so, and you, you have a lot of your organizations, they, they recognize that they have a need for uh, to provide uninterrupted un service for, like, say, your doctors or some other health care uh, workers. Maybe for, like, functions, including voice texting, web browsing, other mobile applications. Um, so they use what we call DAS uh, technology, distributed antenna system technology. Uh, and it basically eliminates uh, those dead spots and uh, other signal uh, issues, issues with signal, um, failure signal coverages within your hospital building. And you can see maybe how uh, that will be um, needed for, say, a physician and stuff when they have very important uh, things that they're trying to accomplish at, at the hospital. Now, you can also classify um, networks um, in terms of them being um, and, um, in terms of them being classified as um, internet or, or extranet. You probably heard of these terms as well. Um, in terms of uh, internet. Internet are lands, are local area networks, and, and they function similar to your internet. However, they are accessible only to the, uh, the internal users of an organization. Okay? Um, and a lot of times you see uh, examples like um, your human resource information. Help desk ticketing systems and stuff will be on a organization intranet, intranet. So it's similar to internet, but it's only accessible to your internal users of your organization. Now your extranet, extranet is similar to your intranet, but it is going to provide uh, content and applications and databases that's going to be accessible to users who are outside the organization. Um, so, for example, maybe the patients or vendors or, say, TCC, the students, when they access TCC's outside website and they're able to do certain things, um, that would be our extra net. Your internet and your extranet are most efficiently maintained using enterprise web content uh, management system, uh, EWCM, and, and those allow um, the different departments to easily update their content on uh, on that network without having to really know HTML programming or have any type of web uh, design skills. Network models. So your network, it transfers data from a sending device to a receiving device. 
um, in order to make that process um, more efficient, those various functions that are necessary to complete that data transfer are going to be divided into what we call network layers. And you have two types of network models that sort of describe that network layer concept. Uh, one being your open systems interconnection model, um, OSI. And then you also have uh, what we call your network model. I mean your internet model, not your network model, your internet model, I'm sorry. So you got your open system interconnection model, OSI, and the internet model. Now, let's look a little bit at um, these two. Um, with your, and so what we're doing is um, taking those various functions and dividing them into network layers. So with your OSI model, you have seven um, layers. Your layer one is your physical layer. Um, this layer is designed to transmit your data bits. Uh, so with a uh, system or a computer, the, best, the basic language is a language of zeros and ones. It's a binary math. And so your physical layer um, in a network layer is the transmitting of data bits. Your bits are zeros and ones, and they make bytes all right, over a communication server. Transmitting, so that's your very basic uh, thing that your computer really understands, and everything else is just layers on top of that. So it transmits those data bits, zeros and ones, over a communication circuit. Now, your layer two is your data link layer, and it's responsible for the physical transmission circuit in layer one and converts it into a circuit ensuring the transmission is error free. So it's responsible for the physical transmission circuit. Converts it into a circuit, okay? Layer three is your network layer. It's just responsible for routing, right? So sending that data uh, uh, where it's supposed to go and ensuring that that message arrives at its destination. Layer four would be your transport layer. It manages end-to-end -end network issues. Establish and manages the logical connections between your sending and receiving devices. Um, performs an error check. Uh, breaks up data packets into smaller packets to transmit that, pack, that data more efficiently. Your layer five is known as your session layer. Um, it initiates, maintains, and terminates logical sessions between end users. Uh, you can think about that in terms of when a person makes a telephone call. Um, and so you pick up the phone, you hit a dial tone, you dial the number, um, the person on the uh, receiving end answers the phone. And so you have created a session where we are both talking to one another. Uh, so your session layer manages security checks and file transfers. All right. So that can be compared to um, you picking up that phone and dialing to connect to that other person and, and to the another phone and, and it initiates the session and then it maintains that session until we do talking and when we hang up, it terminates it. All right. So that's all. That's an example of layer five, the session layer. Layer six is your presentation layer. It manages the formatting of the data being transferred so that it's presented to that end user, regardless of what type of device that the end user is using. It's also responsible for compressing um, the data. And then layer seven is your application layer. Uh, it manages the end user's access to the network, including applications and programs. Uh, it, it network monitoring and network management also occurs um, in the uh, in the application layer. All right, and so uh, to your right side is a different model. Um, it's the uh, 
internet model, right? And that you might also hear called the Transmission Control Protocol Internet Protocol TCP/IP, which is the same thing as your internet model. Transmission Control Protocol Internet Protocol TCP/IP. Right. It's it's a little more simpler than your OSI model. It's also the model that defines the internet. This is the protocol that the internet uses, TCP slash IP. So what's interesting um how your HIS works is pretty what it's really complex. It's made up of a lot of multiple independent layers that function autonomously, but also yet work together with the other um, different layers. And so that makes it pretty, uh, really interesting. But in this internet model, it pretty much stays the same as the OSI model for layers one through four. But combine the OSI model layers five through seven into layer 4, which is labeled the application layer. Alright, so number 4 sort of changes. So actually 1 through 3, it stays the same. 4 stays the same as the OSI model, but they combine layer 5 through 7 all into layer 4, and they call that the application layer, and that makes up your internet uh, model. Okay? All right. So each of your network layers are going to communicate with the other layers um, when there's uh, when there's a transmission of data between your sending uh, and receiving computers. They will use software to perform those different functions at each of those network layers. And so as such, each of those network layers are going to use a, a protocol to define how it will operate at each of those layers. So they use protocols. Um, an example of that will be our email. When an end user creates a uh, message or email using a web browser and sends that message to another user who will also receive and read that message using a web browser, then you, all these protocols uh, come into play. For instance, your hypertext transfer protocol, HTTP, is used at an application layer to create a HTTP request packet, which is going to include the message from the sender. Then you have your TCP, your transmission control protocol, which is used at the transport layer to break those the HTTP packet into one smaller size HTTP packet place each of these smaller HTTP packets into your TCP packet and determine the destination server address, then open a connection to the destination server for the transfer of the TCP packet. Then your IP or your internet pro protocol at the network layer determines what their next stop is on, the, on their way to the de their destination server, packages the TCP packet into an IP packet, sends the IP packet to the next stop, your Ethernet protocol is used at the data link layer to format the message, provide error checking, and IP packet into the Ethernet packet, and then instruct the physical hardware to transmit the Ethernet packet to the next stop. The physical layer takes the Ethernet packet, transmits it over the network cable as a series of positive and negative electrical impulses. When the destination server receives the electrical impulses, the preceding steps are carried out in the reverse order. All right, and I actually have a video to illustrate what I just talked about, and so it will be posted for um, your your viewing pleasure to get for you to have a better understanding of um, how these protocols work and how this occurs. Storage area network 
They're dedicated back-end computer systems um, designed to efficiently and effectively store and transfer a healthcare organization's server data. So all that data that server is storing, that's, um, they store and transfer that using uh, SAN, storage area network. Um, they're centrally storing and providing access to data from multiple server systems. It provides high provides high availability um, with no single point of failure. All right, so they have no single point of of, of failure. Um, and, and basically that means that um, no one single hardware component will be able to disrupt access to that data. So your traditional methods for storing data will involve using directly attached storage where each server stores its associated data to its hard drives or your HDDs directly attached to itself. But this has a lot of limitations and as well as users are wanting more and more storage capacity and performance. So it, it kind of limits that. Um, we still have those um, directly attached storage systems, um, but fans are quickly taking their place because they're high capacity, faster access, they greater availability, stronger security at less cost. Um, there are different types of fans. Um, you got your fiber channel, your LC fans, and your network attached storage NOS NAS devices. And so, really, uh, it, it, what these are, they, they uh, the data stored on a a HDD or hard disk drive. Um, but what they do is place all these hard drives into a redundant array of independent drives. They call them RAIDs, a redundant array. Configuration with the data being co copied across multiple drives. All right, so already you have um, layer this where your data is not in one place is where something can potentially cause uh, an interruption like a hard disk fail uh, and interrupt your data. There are four RAID configurations. Again, RAID is redundant array of independent drives. Um, you got your RAID 1, RAID 5, RAID 5 is fair, and RAID 10, and they all um, kind of have different ways that they go about um, um, Storing your data information. Some are more expensive than others. Some have more capabilities, but they pretty much do what we just described. Um, your RAID 1 is often used uh, for a standalone server operating system. Um, your RAID 5 um, is used as a cost effective and acceptably performing con configuration. For both directly attached and fan data storage environments. So they use for different, depending on um, how your organization is set up, that will determine which one of these um, that they will use in terms of uh, fan uh, uh, systems. When you have very, when you're trying to support very large amounts of data, then fans will be um, the way to, to go because um, they have, they create what we call disk pools. Disk pools, uh, and which vary in size, speed, and cost, because they use those different RAID configurations, and they have different hard disk drive sizes and access times. Um, and your fans, they uh, communicate with each other using either a uh, Ethernet or a uh, FC fiber channel over Ethernet, or they use an Internet small computer system interface protocol. They also use high speed fiber optic cabling and network switches. Now, um, fans that have a medium to high storage capacity, uh, but they don't have high performance requirements, they can be configured using your NOS, your network attached storage device. And your NOS systems use your Ethernet IP protocol over standard LAN switches um, in order to present storage to your servers and other devices on your network. Your voice um, over internet protocol, VOIP, and your unified com, um, communications, UC, 
are emerging technologies that we see in healthcare organizations. Um, they enable your IP, your VOP, VOIP, uh, enable your IP networks to use voice applications like messaging and collaboration. Um, they're very cost effective solutions that they run over existing IP networks. Um, they use lands and land connections uh, that's in place with the internet, um, supporting that voice traffic over your data circuit. So you no longer have to have a dedicated analog uh, circuit, um, and you can just leverage your existing data network. Your voice over wireless local area networks, you got your um, WLAN. Um, they integrate mobile devices using um, your wireless LAN. Your um, UC, which was your um, unified communication, those um, technologies they integrate uh, they integrate your real time communication services uh, like you have like your instant messaging uh, will be under that. Uh, you got your uh, video conferencing, web conferencing. They use a single consistent user interface to provide one or more services along with transferring that data over your IP network. Um, an example of that would be like your virtual meeting things that you can do now, like your district go to meeting, your web conferencing, and those things like that. You got instant, instant messaging that this makes possible. Um, and in healthcare, they use those over a secure, uh, they use a secure type application um, to realize your instant messaging and chat features. Computing. Uh, when we're talking about computing, something that's important is um, data, data centers. Um, your data centers are those facilities where your um, health information system is located. Okay, um, one of your first decisions in, in terms of a healthcare organization is that they uh, whether they're going to maintain their own uh, data centers, or they're going to lease one, uh, or um, they're going to outsource it. So they have to figure out what they're going to do about uh, storing their um, health information system. Another important decision would be that uh, data center consolidation. As uh, technology uh, increases and the new ones are, are steadily coming out, they tend to be um, a lot more faster. Um, they don't take as much up as much space and those types of things. And so, what you have to uh, start considering is um, consolidating your data centers. You might not need as much as you at one time needed. So that is an important uh, decision that needs to be addressed by the or, uh, organization. Um, your cloud uh, computing, you need to figure out what uh, organization needs to figure out what their position is going to be um, with the evolving technology of cloud computing. Cloud computing um, is associated with delivering hosted services with the goal of providing easy, scalable access to computing resources and IT services. They basically just put it all up in, a, they call it a cloud, and you uh, access that information from there. It's not actually on, on the system. These type services are organized into three categories. You got infrastructure as a service, IaaS, a platform as a service, PaaS, and a software as a service, SaaS. All right, and with a IaaS hosted type of solution, your um, vendor that supplies that data uh, center, they're going to give. They will uh, provide you with the server hardware and your network connectivity. And then the organization installs and manages its server operation systems, applications, and the database itself. Now, when you're looking at a uh, platform as a service, it works similar to that um, infrastructure as a service. 
uh, except that the cloud vendor also supplies the server operating system. Now, with a uh, SAS, which is a software as a service, the cloud vendor also installs and manages all your pre they, they install and manage all the previously mentioned components along with the software. With an EAS, which is your uh, EMR as a service, the vendor fully hosts the EMR solution as well. Your uh, cloud uh, in cloud computing, you can also it can be also categorized categorized as being private or public. Um, when you have public cloud, that for example, Amazon uh, has a public cloud. Uh, they can sell um, sell service to anyone on the internet. But then you also can have private clouds that are uh, here about proprietary network. Uh, and data centers, and they supply secure and hosted services for particular organizations, so they can be public or private. Um, with data centers, there are a number of critical components that have to be managed. Um, your most costly um, operational expense is going to be the electrical power it consumes. Um, the a green data center concept is one um, that comes to mind where they try attempt to reduce that power usage. It's an initiative that attempts to reduce that power usage using energy efficient equipment. Um, um, your primary power user comes from your commercial utility uh, company. Um, in the event that the utility power uh, fails, the um, data center should be configured so that they automatically fall over to using um, backup power, maybe in a battery supported form. Your typical power path would be your UPS, your uninterruptible, uninterruptible power supply, um, and a, a Flywheel driven continuous power source, CPS, or a combination of those two. So your backup power is going to be very important so that those HIS applications remain available and accessible. Um, like I said, they usually use batteries to provide electricity. And so um, with your UPS, and they're usually less expensive. Than your um, non-battery backup systems like the CPS system. There also also should be um, service level agreements for your data centers with your fuel companies uh, to, deliver, to, to deliver fuel until your utility power is restored. Um, and they're often equipped with local storage tanks that they hold um, tens of thousands of gallons of fuel. You also need to consider um, your cooling of your data center because um, with all that densely configured systems in there all together, it can produce a lot of heat. So you need to consider your, the cooling aspect. You want to protect your data center from damage by fire um, and and, uh, and with, uh, by fire and fire suppression systems and those types of things. Uh, if a, there is a catastrophic um, life threatening event that occurs within a data center and um, it terminates your electricity, in which terminating electricity is your only option in order to resolve the situation, then you need an emergency power off switch should be available or EPO. Um, you can BCMS is your branch circuit monitoring system. They can be deployed in your data centers to monitor and manage electrical circuits and provide data center staff with the ability to ensure that data center equipment has sufficient electrical capacity. You have BCMS is your data center management system. Um, they allow data center personnel to design and proactively manage. Um, these and additional data center technology. A business continuity and disaster recovery uh, plan is important. Um, when we talk about business continuity, we're talking about those processes and steps 
um, that the organization puts in place to make sure that their essential business functions will continue during and after a disaster. Uh, it, it's, it's very critical that um, the risk of a, civic, of a system outage or a downturn disaster be mitigated. So they have to think about this and plan ahead and identify and prioritize um, the criticality of their various HIS components, uh, determine what will be the appropriate recovery time and, and re recovery point in, in the event of a disaster or uh, unplanned system outage. Backup systems are another key technology that they, uh, a, a organization can leverage to make sure their HIS and data is available. Um, they have tape backup systems, disk based backup systems, the virtual tape library um, to back up um, their data. This is going to conclude part one of our systems and management presentation.